action. Though I don't think well, scientifically there's really any doubt that global climate change is taking place. But, okay, so if in fact this is happening, then we come back to dollar value. Congressional Budget Office is saying by 2020, every family's looking to spend about $175. Of course, you get the Heritage Foundation, which is a libertarian organization, of course, but they're saying, no, the number's more like $1,800 per family. I mean, this is a drastic difference. And no one really isn't taking into account what happens to GDP. If we are spending more money on electricity and energy and things like that, that's less money into the economy overall. So. I mean, I guess, Patrick, first to you, then, Lester, I'd love for you here to hear your side of this, but consumers clearly don't want to pay this kind of money. Yeah, Tracy, it's interesting you point out. So let's let's see Patrick for a long time. Well, hold on one second. Lester, we'll let Patrick answer. He hasn't spoken in a little while, and then we'll, let you, we'll get you okay, to jump in. Go ahead, Patrick. Thank you. Tracy, it's interesting you point out the CBO analysis. And what's important to note there is that analysis only priced the cap-and-trade portion of this legislation. As I just stated, this legislation is 1,500 pages in length. There's something called a renewable electricity mandate in there. There's something mm -hmm. uh, that will require homeowners, before they go to sell their home, to meet a federal building code standard. So if their home's not green enough, they're going to have to pay to retrofit that home. That cost was not taken into account when CBO performed its analysis. Uh, there are other provisions in this legislation, uh, such as you know, new homes. If, if you want to build a home, you have to meet a standard of where your electricity outlets can be. You have to use certain types of light bulbs, as the president pointed out earlier this week. I think the overarching theme here is, are the American people willing to pay, whether it be you know, a postage stamp a day or whether it be uh, $3,100 a year? You have to ask that question. And, and as I said, the Rasmussen poll pointed out the other day that 67% of the American people are opposed to that. So it goes back to the fundamental question of do the economic benefits um, you know, makes sense here. Is there, is there a cost benefit here that, that really makes sense to the American people? And I would argue that it doesn't. Lester, what do you think? I mean, if this really is an issue, a postage stamp a day isn't that bad, if that really be the true number. Well, I, 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 first of all, I agree that this is a matter of trying to take a look at what are the costs and benefits of all this stuff. Uh, as we do the calculation, it looks as if uh, abating uh, the carbon dioxide emissions in the United States would cost about 1% of GDP. Now, if, if, if you're in one camp, you say 1% of GDP, my, we can't afford that. If you're in another camp, 1% of GDP really isn't all that much. Take a look at what's been going on uh, during 2008, where oil prices got up to $147 a barrel. That's a lot more than 1% of GDP. But the other, and, and so if you're looking at this new uh, waxman uh, markey legislation, I don't think there's anybody who loves that legislation. It's filled with all kinds of giveaways and so on. I testified before Senator Bingaman's committee on, on how much of the renewable portfolio standard was justified. Look, we're trying to see whether there's a bill here that can get passed to Congress, whether that bill does generally the right stuff, right. not whether every point in there is correct. I, too, don't like this notion of de detailed regulations. On the other hand, Americans have been living with cheap energy for a very long time. Our cars are very inefficient in the world. Our houses, our buildings are very inefficient in the world. Uh, for example, uh, in Japan and in Western Europe, uh, the, the amount of energy per dollar of GDP is about half of what it is in the United States. If you look at energy per capita, it's about half of what it is in the United States. There's a tremendous amount of efficiency that we can get that's justified right now on a cost basis, but we don't do it because we don't pay any attention to energy. This legislation is going to force hey. us to pay more attention to Patrick, it, and there are going to be a lot of savings that come out of that. Patrick, this is something that I struggle with, with a lot of the stuff that's going on in the administration right now. This whole notion of just getting something through, just doing something just to get it done. It seems that we're on some roller coaster to cure all ails these days. Is it necessary to rush something like this through right now, today, when this, you know, we're trying very hard to get this economy back to where it needs to be? You point out an interesting point there, uh, Tracy. If you look at the House vote last week, it passed with seven votes, uh, and that was despite all the arm twisting and backroom deals that the professor pointed out. There are a ton of political carve-outs in this legislation. Uh, there were folks that were uh, feeding at the trough to see that their industries weren't adversely as impacted as others. But like I said, you know, you know, we can look at an example. Look at Spain. Uh, you know, they had the screening of the economy in the late 90s, in the early 2000s. Uh, and it's, it's been proven. Uh, for every one green job created in Spain, we lost 2.2 others. Nine out of 10 of those green jobs are no longer with us today. And I think the icing on the cake is 
Spain's greenhouse gas and CO2 emissions have increased 50% uh, since 1999. So the greening of the economy and this renewable uh, electricity mandate, that doesn't necessarily coincide with a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, as, as Spain showed you. And I think it's important, and as the president pointed out earlier this week, uh, with the carbon tariff in this bill, yeah. when we have our large competitors like China and India who aren't going to adhere to these same standards, uh, we're putting our domestic industries at a competitive disadvantage when competing in the global economy. And I think that's an important thing to note. I think you, we could all agree that there I, were I, things, or we all have agreed, there are things in this bill that, uh, that you know, certain groups are not going to like. And you're right, the president even, who's obviously in support, did come out against the protectionist measures and right. the tariffs that have been pointed out. We've got to run here to another guest, uh, but to Lester, let me just give the last word to you on the idea, since you're a supporter in, you know, in general, I know there's specifics that you don't like, but in general of the idea, why is cap and trade specifically the answer uh, to this, providing essentially economic incentives and allowing a, a, a market-based system. And one of the ironic parts about this, just real quick as an aside, somebody brought this up the show a month or two ago, is that this almost seems like a market-based Republican proposal, you know, if it had happened years ago, is that it's, it's based on trading. It's, it's funny the, the idea that it comes up now and it's, it's opposed by, it's a, it's by those point. groups. But that said, why is that proposal the best way to tackle this, Lester, do you think? Well, since, since the late 1960s, we've had a lot of environmental legislation. Initially, it was always command and control regulations. You must do this. We in Washington know exactly what you need to do. What we then found beginning uh, in the, with the 1990 Clean Air Act is that uh, we can lower uh, emissions, in that case of sulfur dioxide, much less uh, expensively by using the marketplace, by looking at the incentives that are in the market, by doing uh, what Americans are so good at, which is to figure out how it is that we can lower the cost of complying with uh, some mandate. And what we found with, uh, carbon di with uh, sulfur dioxide legislation is that the cost of controls was probably less than one-third of what it had been estimated to be. And so if we're going to do this, it's very important that we do it at the least cost. And that's exactly what this cap-and-trade uh, provision is going to do for us. Uh, and so even though there's all this horse trading, even though this bill is going to emerge as something which I, I think not even a mother could love, it's still going in the right direction. It's still getting us to, uh, to, to abate uh, global warming, and it's going to get us there at the least cost. Uh, well, the cost part's important to you. All right, Lester and Patrick, good discussion. Thanks to, to both of you for Thank coming you. on. Um, much appreciated. Thanks for having me.